Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here today. So my name is Yuko Butler from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I'm going to talk about digital gaming and young L2 learners today. So what is a game, first of all? Games can be defined a type of play with goals and rules, but it's kind of difficult to define it in precise fashion. Games can be used by all people in all cultures to acquire various knowledge and skills. When it comes to digital games, Garis and his colleagues identified six features that are fantasy, roles and goals, sensory stimuli, challenges, mystery, and control. Games can be classified into different types. For the purpose of the today's talk, I'd like to draw your attention to the classif classification between serious games and commercial games. Serious games are games that are specifically designed for instructional purposes. Commercial games are pr primarily designed for entertainment purposes. But commercial games uh, can be used for uh, instructional purposes as well so that the distinction between them in practice may not be always clear cut. Digital games have become part of many young people's lives. As this statistic shows, males in particular spend much time playing games. On weekends, one third of the males spend more than four hours per day. Now, after the COVID-19, we can expect that the numbers probably went up even more then what would be the potential benefits to use digital games for language learning? So there are a couple of important elements for successful language learning that includes having meaningful input and active use of language. Now, this is a very well known in language education, but it's not always easy um, to exercise in the classroom, depending on the types of games, but we can expect to receive authentic input if we play interactive games in the target language. Second, engaging in cognitively challenging and enjoyable tasks. Now, games are fun and enjoyable, but being enjoyable means cognitively challenging. Digital games that are popular among children often contain a number of elements that are attractive to children. And third, making use of repetition or iteration from the point of view of dynamic complex theory. Iteration is not a simple repetition. Every time you repeat, it means something different. But in any event, repeated use of the target language is an indispensable process in language learning. Digital games often give players to be exposed to the target language and with fun. In one of my own studies, my colleagues and I had a chance to analyze a big data set where 4,000 Japanese children aged 4 to 12 play serious games to learn English. It turns out that the children on average play the games 100 times per game. So almost all, all of them kept on playing until they reached the perfect score. Given that you can listen to few English words and phrases by playing game once, you can imagine how much input the children actually could get by playing the games. It is almost impossible to provide such input in classrooms alone. It has been suggested that people who have grown up in digital games may have different cognitive skills um, compared with the previous generations. Here is what Prinsky suggested. Game generations are much faster are processing information. They're also more comfortable with processing multiple information simultaneously or in a parallel fashion rather than a linear fashion. Graphics are no longer subordinate for text. That would change the way we conceptualize literacy. They tend to start with multiple sources and process them in less sequential manner or even random fashion. The digital generations are so used to get connected with others through email, chats, and SNS at any time and anywhere. They tend to take different approaches to get information and solve problems. They prefer active learning. And then for them, play is work. They are not separated. Work and then play is not separate. They are not separated. 
the game generation gets so used to receive rewards at each level of the games so that um, they have less patience with things that they don't pay off at the level that they expect. Fantasy and reality may not be clear cut for them, and definitely technology is their friends. So what we talk about so far is that young people spend much time on digital games. They must be attractive for them. So there are some hints for improving in, in motivation by looking at games. The digital games have features that match well with elements for successful learning. Digital generations may have different cognitive styles and preferred learning strategies. So maybe there are some hints for successful learning as well. But how best to design instructional games for children is not totally clear. Then I conducted a study looking into digital game designing, but from the children's point of view, because they have unique preferred learning styles that are different from the previous generations. So this study that I'm going to share with you today is about design a language learning tasks for digital instructional games for young learners of foreign language from children's point of view by asking children identify motivation elements and learning elements. By asking children incorporate these elements and design a game in a group. And also by asking children evaluate their own and their peers designs so that we can understand what they value. This game design project had uh, four, uh, six steps. The first four steps, um, the sixth grade Japanese children aged 11 to 12 years old designed instructional game tasks for English vocabulary learning in group. So designed for a little bit younger kids, fifth graders, they incorporated both game elements and learning elements. And at step five, professional game designers developed the game based on the children's ideas. And at the last step, the fifth graders played the game and evaluated its effectiveness. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus on the first four steps in this presentation. So the participants are 86 uh, sixth grade students um, at pri public, um, public primary school in Japan. Based on the survey, uh, most of them had some experience with digital learning. In the first step, the participating children were asked to think why games are fun and what kinds of features attracted them, first individually and then discuss in a small group and then in a whole class while they play and then examine existing game examples. In the last 10 minutes of the class, we introduced 35 new English words to the children by uh, fresh cards. These are the words that, they, that we used. We told them that they don't need to learn everything, but we asked them to choose five words and then learn them as a homework. They are told to pay attention to, attention to how they learned the words. The children were asked to write down which words they chose to learn and then why they chose them and what kinds of strategies that they used. So we first expected that probably many children um, you know, chose easiest words to learn, but it was not the case in fact. It turns out that the children wanted to learn words that denote objects of their own interest. For example, uh, one child says, I chose animal words because I like animals or words that sounds kind of funny for them or attractive for them, or words that they thought useful, or the words that are novel or challenging to them. One boy said, I chose most difficult ones that my big brother would not know. And in the step two, the children discuss how they chose and learned the five words given at the homework and identify strategies that could facilitate their vocabulary learning. So after identifying vocabulary learning strategies, basically means a learning elements, the students discuss how these elements were incorporated in existing instructional games through examining example games. 
In the remaining of the class, the professional game designer taught the children how professionals draw storyboards when designing games so that the children can create similar version of storyboards, or I would say simpler version of the storyboards. This is an example of storyboards that the professional game designers presented to the children. And in the step three, uh, children were told to develop a game for learning English words in group for younger grade students, fifth, grade, fifth graders. Once the group members came up with a plan, each group drew a storyboard on a large paper for their oral presentation. And in the final step, each group presented their plan using their storyboards and answer questions from the peers. At the end of each group presentation, the students evaluated their peers' game design as well as their own based on the criteria, meaning elements, that they, then, that they themselves came up with. So the children wrote their variation in an open-ended format, like you see here. So they're asked to identify which game and learning elements were most strategically incorporated in each game design in order to make the games enjoyable and effective for vocabulary learning. So I'll show you the result now. First, game and learning elements identified by children. So these are the game elements or motivational elements and learning elements. I won't go through them one by one, but amazingly, the children identified almost everything that the researchers have been discussing in the literature. So they already have very sophisticated theories of motivation and learning by themselves. Then what elements did the children incorporate in their own games? The children developed 15 game designs altogether. So this figure indicates the frequency of the elements found in the 15 game designs. With respect to the game elements, all the, ga all the games had a clear rules, goals and objectives, outcome and feedback, challenge, sound and visual effects, and speed and time limitation. Having fantasy and then having a chance to repeat and recover and having a control over the game playing were also frequently incorporated. Now, regarding the uh, learning elements, all the games had elements of repetition, imitation, and reviewing. Metacognitive strategy elements, like controlling one's own learning and choosing to learn the words of his or her interest, were also relatively common among the game designs. Then what about the elements that the children valued? With respect to the game elements, the children valued highly of challenges. For example, game offers multiple difficulty levels and stages as the player progresses, or on having fantasy or unrealistic elements. And we have a number of adventure games. So this is a good example. And then including a game using a fairy tales and a game where the main character named Johnny needed to res rescue a kidnapped snowman. You might wonder why snowman was kidnapped in the first place. And that, that was like a detective story and it was very creative fun, creative and fun. The children also valued having control over their prey. The player can choose enemies or controlling the speed and so forth, or tracking performance, visible outcome and instant feedback, as well as having obstacles. Now, interestingly, the elements such as competition was not utilized nor valued by the children. It was very curious because they play competitive games all the time, but they do not like competition when it comes to learning. They learned in their own way with their own pace. For the learning elements, the children value the elements of repetition, imitation, and reviewing, and the use of, use of multiple modalities and methods in order to enhance encoding. As in a unique case, there was a game with a sub-function um, in which the main character, the player's avatar, would lose his hair if he would not play the game every day. That basically shows a very strategically emphasizing the importance of daily practice of foreign word learning. 
by the way, if the players actually um, decided to play the game again, meaning reviewing the material again, then he and his avatar um, can dye his hair in any color that he wants. So how to make your avatar looks cool is such a strong motivation for them as well. The children also like to operate, um, the children also like the option for choosing words to learn by themselves based on their interests and having control over their own learning. Now, I'd like to show you one uh, example, the concrete example. Um, the title of this game is Companies President's Commute. Um, this is just a very creative title for our English learning game. In this game, our players become the president of a company in an imaginary town. So the goal is to get to the office on time in spite of the number of challenges, basically English word quizzes. They can choose to be the president of their own tiny company or run a large multinational corporation. A small company owner may commute on foot, whereas the owner of a large corporation may use a private jet. However, the more difficult the level chosen, the more complicated the maze, more quizzes encountered, and the less the time available for the avatar to reach the destination. So you can choose the difficulty level and control your learning. Moreover, if the player cannot get to the office on time, the company goes bankrupt. So while praying employees, while praying, employees are cheering in front of the office. So you can actually see that a social factor is used as a motivational element in this case. Furthermore, if the prayer cannot answer the English quizzes, it's possible to ask one of the employees for help by cashing in points. So the prayer can choose which, which employees to ask for help, but different employees' assistant cost different amounts. So as an unexpected element in the game, an employee with no title may have the correct answer, whilst the vice president may be clueless, even if the player has to pay more points to receive assistance from the vice president. So um, unexpected elements, which does not create a linear relationship between the learning and points, which we as a teacher often rely on, but um, such an unexpected elements are strategically used as a motivational element in, the, in this game. A student from this team, when she was asked why they had this unexpected element in their game design, she answered that this way, the students who are not good at English can still enjoy the game. Other groups also have such elements such as player's vehicle suddenly has an engine trouble and so forth. So in conclusion, the digital games have potential to assist children's learning, language learning as a complementary to classroom learning. I'm not suggesting that games should take over the classroom instruction. I'm just suggesting that they can be used strategically in a complementary fashion. In fact, I did not have a chance to talk about the individual differences in this talk, but game-based learning may or may not be for everybody that digital generations may have different cognitive and motivational strategies. So um, instruction should match with them. Children have already developed sophisticated theories of learning and motivation and uh, could incorporate them in their game designs. Listen to their voices is critically important to develop instruction, which corresponds well with their cognitive and motivational styles. This is end of my talk and thank you very much for your attention.